So we bless the Lord this evening who has enabled yet another meeting of our platform. We thank him for his faithfulness in our, our nation. Thank him for his faithfulness in our lives. And brethren, whatever it is that we're seeing in Nigeria at this time, the encouragement is that the plan that God has concerning this nation, when you look at it and you measure it against the things that are happening, and particularly because the slant of the prophecies have changed into one in which God was angry and was saying that he was going to destroy us and all of that. God is now speaking about a new Nigeria, and I think that should encourage our mm -hmm. hearts. Now, in mm -hmm. encouraging our hearts, wow. I believe the Lord gave me a burden, which I started last week. Uh, we started the burden last week, and uh, the title is Evaluating Your Christian Journey. Evaluating Your Christian Journey. Well, either I call it Evaluating Your Christian Journey or Evaluating Our Christian Journey, because it's also a message that I believe is relevant to, to, to me as well. There is no exclusion background, even though I won't go over all the things that we have done last week, because we have a recording. Um, but it's important to just set the, why is it that we're looking at the, at the, at the topic? You know, and I think the key, uh, the key scripture is the scripture of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 29, sorry. Isaiah, Matthew 16, verses seven to nine, you know, where, you know, people had come to Jesus and then was talking about the sign of the times and they cannot discern and do this and do that. And so they, they came to accuse Jesus that his disciples do certain things, you know, uh, concerning traditions and so on. Jesus re responded by saying that these people worship God in vain uh, because only um, the, the, their heart is far from God, but um, you know, they only worship the Lord with their, with their mouth and with their lips and their heart is far from God. And then they are teaching and have doctrines that are based upon the commandments of men. So Jesus summarized and said that where you have these two or either of these two things going, uh, the worship of God is in vain. Now, what is the true worship of God? Jesus himself defined it as John captured it in John chapter four, uh, where he says, even now, you know, not in Jerusalem or in this mountain shall people worship the Lord, but the people shall worship God, shall worship him in spirit and in truth, because the Father seeketh such people to worship him. So the true worship of God is in spirit. When we have scriptures like this, then we need to define what does it mean to worship God in spirit? What does it mean to worship God in truth? And in a way to just bring it in layman's language, we decided to just look at seven steps by which we can evaluate our Christian journey. What are pillars, you know, that um, we can use or we can look at as we evaluate our, our Christian journey. Because at the end of the day, we do not want our service to God to be in vain. I remember saying last week, citing 1 Corinthians 3.13, where Paul began to write to the church in Corinth, that, you know, every man's work will be made manifest and every man's work will be tried by fire. And so anything that will not stand the test of the fire of God, he said, all of those things are going to be, um, they're going to be uh, burnt off, uh, even though the man is saved as by fire. So, and I think I remember also mentioning Paul going to, after going for 14 years into Arabia, coming back to Peter to just come and check, say, look, oh, this is what I've been teaching. I hope I've been right. And Peter gave him approval and the right hand of fellowship that everything was teaching was in order. So Christianity is not something we're just born into. It's not something that we just say, oh, we've been a Christian all our lives. There is a right way to serve God, and there is a, a wrong way to serve God. 
Now, among the things that we looked at, we began to look at um, the first three stages last week. And um, you will pardon me, I'm trying to, I've tried to condense as much as possible these things into, a t into teachings that will not last too long. Uh, because if you look at some of the topics that we are condensing, on some of them I've written entire books. So it has been really tough to try and bring all of these things in the perspective in which it can come just like a, a message that we can, we can glean and look at the topics in relation to some of the other topics that have a bearing on our, on our work with the Lord. Uh, we, we, we began from, from the fundamentals and began to look at the first stage wherein we describe, describe that as um, the proper understanding of being born again and its implications. Uh, because this is recorded, I don't want to go over the topics so that we can save some time. And we declare that the second stage is the desire for personal growth in God through the knowledge of the world. So after we become born again, you know, you know, the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. Now, so it means that just like an infant, even when an infant is born, what happens? You know, when the infant begins to feel some pangs of hunger, you see the infant even with closed eyes, you know, is just uh, reaching for something that should come to the mouth. And it's an automatic thing. It, it just comes by instinct. And the child just, you know, as if there's something that's supposed to go in there. Not because the infant had the experience of it in the womb, because everything was supplied by the umbilical cord. But as soon as the child is born into life, it becomes a natural instinct. And in this way, when somebody also is properly born again, the instinct Instinct must be that the person desires to grow in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his ways. We treated that last week, like I said. And the third stage has to do with understanding fellowship and the body of Christ. I was looking at these things in the progression in which it becomes easy, easy for us to imbibe in our Christian life. Because after you now begin to know God, you are reading the Bible, God is revealing himself to you. Then you come to realize that you are not the only person on this road. There are other people. And so there is ministry to you. There is ministry from you to other people. And um, we become a community of God's people because like, like I said last week, it is a kingdom that came from heaven with the rules of heaven, with the manifesto of heaven, um, concerning how God who created the earth and created man desires that men should live upon the earth. Now, because men rebelled and disobeyed God, you know, we all were, became distant from God. And Jesus came to mend the fence. He repaired the wall of partition so that fellowship again can come to God. And so as we become members of that body, as we become members of the body, what happens? We become a community of God. It's God's kingdom from heaven, but manifested upon the earth. And um, the need for us to work together, a Christian must understand it. Now, it is not just enough that we come in fellowship. It goes much more than that. There is diversity. And so coping with that diversity is part of the is part of the work of understanding the fellowship and the body of Christ. But one thing that I didn't say last week is the, the commandment of love that must be within the body. The and um, quoted by John in John 13, 34, says a new commandment I give you, a new commandment I leave with you, that you should love one another even as I have loved you. And so Paul, expatiating on this, began to talk about when one person suffers, all the other people suffer with him. When one person rejoices, all the other people rejoice with him. And we saw the examples in the Acts of the Apostles and in the, in the epistles, where the people in Macedonia needed help, where you know relief was made for some people who were experiencing famine, 
So not because they knew them face to face, but because they were of kindred spirit. And so when one portion of the body was suffering, everybody identified with that portion and effort was made by the different churches to just see that relief was brought to those areas. So um, having said all that, it is important to iterate, to reiterate rather, that the body of Christ, when it comes to ministry and when it comes to fellowship, the body is without denominations. I cannot go into that at all now. The body of Christ in its operation is without denominations. And in a number of teachings, which I intend to do, um, I actually want to do it as a video, you know, for the general church. It will come about two or three teachings um, on the same topic to just drive the matter home. Because I mean, the church must understand that denominationalism is not part of the scheme of God. Uh, but some people argue that this has been with us for, you know, well over 500 years. And, you know, the church has expanded and all manner of things have happened. That is why the teachings have to be actually exhaustive to be able to look at all the ramifications of it. So let us go on today as God helps us and let us see how far we go. Um, I am hoping that when this is over, there may be aspects of um, the stages um, that are required that I might have overlooked. Uh, in such a case, my intention is that by the grace of God, we just open up our platform for us to be able to discuss it. And other people can bring other areas of these stages that I might have overlooked. And um, in the hope that, you know, we all just grow together and we are all blessed together. So, let me go on to the fourth stage, which is understanding ministry and the unity of the spirit. Understanding ministry and the unity of the spirit. Now, notice that we are moving now from, from understanding fellowship. You know, fellowship is a bit different from ministry. We're just moving from fellowship and understanding the structure of the body of Christ so that we can find our place, we can find our oppression, you know, within fellowship. We know that we have to give love, even also within the body, it is um, our privilege to also receive love. And in many areas where there are errors, I've tried to highlight some of those things as I have gone through the different stages. Now, in the area of ministry, there are lots of errors. And um, I am hoping that um, <clears throat> as I speak and as I cite some of those things, particularly also citing the scriptures um, indicating those errors, I think we will find agreement. And like we said, God is about bringing about a new Nigeria. And with a new Nigeria, a new crop of ministers will come. So much has been revealed by prophecy that certain things are going to be done away with. And when they, and you know, so that the perfect can come. And when that perfect is come, the Bible says, that which is imperfect shall be done away with. So it's important that. that as we anticipate what God. is about to do and we become the, that in this new dispensation spell not just in the teaching but also in the operation and the manifestation of it you know we will go out without carrying the errors of the past so in a step-by-step -step manner let us begin to look at you know what is it what is ministry what is ministry and you know i like biblical definitions um um, in the letter to the Hebrews, yes, letter to the Hebrews, um, we have what we can use as a very good definition for ministry. And um, in Hebrews chapter five and verse one, uh, the Bible tells us that every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. 
Now, but you know, the really useful part of this, uh, which I take as the definition, is that every man in ministry is taken from among men. So first of all, it has to be a man. They are not angels. They are not spirits. They are men and they are taken from among men. And God ordains them by the calling with which he called them from before the foundation of the world, that they will come to, to manifest at a point in time whereby they will have responsibility. They will have responsibility for, man, for how do I say it now? For declaring the things that pertain unto God, unto men, you know, and then the, 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 the other part of it is that as priests unto God, we also take the burdens of men, the environment, and all of those other things, and we can also take it to God. So we are taking from among men and ordained for men in things pertaining to God. So I think it's a good definition that serves. The summary of it is that God appoints people so that they become of service in the matters of God to his people. Now, if we're looking for another definition, uh, we might just easily also take the definition that we can, you know, we can paraphrase in, in John chapter one and verse 14. Uh, it says the word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us. That is, there are things of God that need to be opened up so that men of flesh will be able to understand them and be able to walk in them. And so people are appointed to be able to do this. And so I become a hypocrite, for instance, if there are things that I am teaching, um, I teach those things and number one, I don't believe them. Uh, I also become a hypocrite if I teach these things and I don't walk in them. And so, well, even if there might be imperfection because none of us is perfect yet, you know, my heart and desire must be that that which the Lord has ordained as, um, as the precept, you know, for living that he has ordained. And Jesus gave us example concerning how to do I must be willing to imbibe those precepts and make them the precepts of my life. Now, so, um, like I said, there are quite a number of errors in ministry, and I want to just quickly dispense with those ones. One of the errors is the dichotomy or a division that you say. Uh, sometimes people say clergy and laity. Now, I, 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 I had to go a little bit in depth into some of these things because I realized now that because we put our videos on YouTube in a different playlist on YouTube, uh, what is happening is that because uh, some people have subscribed, I think um, each time we put any video on YouTube, uh, they also get the benefit of knowing that this thing has come into the same, because they have the same umbrella. Uh, and I think that people who watch these videos and so, brethren, so please don't let it look like I am pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just sharing so that, you know, we have the full, we have this full scope of understanding of what is supposed to be. So we notice that Jesus never gave the example of clergy and laity. Now, there is a misconception, in my own opinion, uh, people usually say that, you know, even Jesus, when he was walking among the disciples, nobody knew who was the master and who was, uh, and that was why, you know, uh, somebody had to identify him and all of that. Well, maybe that may seem to support the argument that, yes, Jesus lived among them and, um, you know, but I rather prefer to express the argument in another way. Now, really, I think that the reason that Jesus needed to be identified was that, you know, the high priest had sold Jesus out. And, you know, they needed, it was the Roman, it was under the Roman government that they could do the things that needed to be done. They couldn't just take him and kill him. They 
he needed to accuse him so that he would appear. So you notice that he wasn't taken before the Sanhedrin. He wasn't taken before the Jewish leaders. He was taken before Pilate and all of these governors and so on. And so because the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus were not Jews. They were not. But you see, I think with, without that argument, the, the, the message can still be documented that Jesus lived with his own people. They slept where he slept. He slept where they slept. He ate what they ate. All of that is valid in the scriptures. But I think that the key thing is that Jesus now in addressing the disciples, servants, he says, I don't call you a relationship with God. We might come as children where we have this kind of interaction with Jesus that he can talk to us and we can talk to him. He doesn't see us as servants. He doesn't see us as, you know, he just sees us as friends. And he addresses us as friends. And, you know, when he was talking and said, even, you know, even though I am your Lord and master, and so I am, he brought himself to a level where, you know, he wanted them to be seen. He wanted to see them as friends, and he actually related to them as friends. So all of that will also demonstrate that in the kingdom, there is no master-servant relationship. Now, my wife was telling me about a video that she watched some time ago. I know that these things are not amongst us. But it is important for us to know that certain things are going on in the world. You know, um, she told me about a man who is supposed to be, who is supposed to be a man of God. But you know that these people can never be men of God. You know, people will come and worship at the feet of this man. And, you know, they begin to, you know, hold his leg and kiss his feet and all of that. And then he will begin to spray naira on them and all that. Now, so these are some of the, uh, uh, you know, the aberrations that, you know, you just see. And, you know, your, I mean, if your own heart is grief, then you can imagine how the heart of God is grief. So Jesus said concerning ministry. There must not be this dichotomy where you say some people are the clergy, some people are the ministers, and some people are the ministers and the and the minister and the ministered too. Everybody is a minister. Um, this this brings me to a, a a verse in Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter six, I think uh, that is where it is, where it says, anyone that is taught in the world should communicate to them that minister. I remember reading this many, many years ago. Let me see if I can quickly find it. Um, oh, Galatians 6 verse 6. It says, let him that is taught in the world communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. What Paul is saying here is that somebody may not even be teaching regularly, but there's a truth that comes to you as somebody who is just reading the scriptures and wow, and this just blows your mind and say, oh wow, it's good to share this. And then you just call somebody who is ministering. You know, I got this thing and it blessed me and all of that, I don't know. You may want to share it anytime that, you know, you're sharing along this area. See, all of these things, this is the way that the body is supposed to function. It is not that, and I'm going to prove very shortly that the way we see ministry and understand it is not the way it is really supposed to be practiced. We're looking at best practices because God is going to manifest the gospel of the kingdom and it is going to start here in Nigeria. I believe that it's going to start with some of us on this platform. I would have said everybody, but you know, I'm not confident to say everybody because it's not everybody that's on the platform or signed on to be on the platform that is taking the benefit of the messages or you know, even if they're not coming to the meetings. So, so Jesus said, you know, that the princes of the Gentiles exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so amongst you. So what we see in the denominations is also an aberration where, you know, 
you know, you just preach. Nobody can ask questions. Nobody can discuss what you have said. Nobody can challenge whatever it is that you have said. Now, that is exercising dominion, feeling that, well, you have delivered to them and nobody else is. Um, maybe we could do better with more share here. But, you know, because of the limitation of time, I think this is why uh, we have these kinds of limitations. And that's why I think going forward, we're going to create more time when in, we won't even, there may be days where we won't even have administration and we just discuss certain topics and have people just contribute. Uh, just like after this one, I intend that by God's grace, maybe we just meet and then discuss the possibilities of, um, you know, how we understand this and whether there are arguments and particularly, you noticed last week that Brad Daniel also said that maybe we should finish this message before we take comments and so on. So we're going to create time for that. Now, in the kingdom of God, in my own understanding, there are only at all, I think there are only two categories of people. And it is not even for men. men to, the, to, to discern. Now, we all come in body. Now, it doesn't matter whether I am old or somebody came to the Lord today. As far as the Lord is concerned, we are all children. Now, it is just the benefit of grace and age that maybe I've known a few things more than somebody who came to the Lord today. That still makes me a child before God. Now, but if God is going to distinguish, now, the only criteria I think that I find in the scriptures by which you can distinguish is whether you are a son, you have grown to sonship. And so he says, as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. So if there's going to be stratification at all, it will just be between children and sons. But the expectation is that anybody who came into the kingdom as a child is also there to grow into sonship, the stages that also take us onto sonship. And so anybody can look at where they are and look at you know where they have attained and where maybe a little bit of work needs to be done. So who are the ministers? If we just ask that question directly. And I will say everyone, everyone, everyone is called to one ministry or the other. And why do I say everyone? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 says so. It declares it. It says, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So everyone has the gift of ministry. And um, the gift of ministry is not only teaching. So that's what we need to understand. It's not only teaching or being apostle and all of that. You know, because immediately that Paul talks about everybody receiving grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, he now goes on into the fact of Jesus descending and ascending and giving gifts to men. And when you look at the root scripture from which that uh, verse is taken, it's about God giving gifts unto men, even unto the rebellious also. So you find out that even people who are not in Christ, they have, instead of using these gifts for God, they decided to use it, um, you know, for worldly purposes. Then when we look in Romans chapter 12 as well, looking at verses 6 to 15, we see other gifts, gifts of administrations, gifts of giving, gifts of, um, you know, uh, giving with cheerfulness and you know we see a load of other gifts there so all of the gifts are not essentially all of the gifts are not essentially gifts of uh, the vocal gifts of that you know somebody is teaching and ministering and all that now look at somebody like uh, Tabitha who was uh, called Docas uh, was called Tabitha you know I believe you know she just had a gift of taking care of widows you know, a gift of helps, you know, and she did it so wonderfully that, you know, when she died, people made an argument to God that such a woman must not die. She cannot die, you know, 
<laughs> there are still many widows to take care of. She cannot die. That was a gift of ministry and so many other gifts that we can identify in the body. There are people like Epaphroditus, who Paul records that, you know, just so that he can minister to the needs of other people. He came near to death. Now that is ministry. You know, you're just caring. There was Gaius, you know, we have Gaius too, who was mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, who was mentioned several times in the Bible, you know, given to hospitality, sponsoring so many things, making sure that, you know, certain, 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 certain ministries were accommodated and all that. So that is ministry. So everybody has a ministry and um, we must understand it in that regard. So that, you know, we don't look down on other people either because we're teaching, because in the area where they're gifted, you know, we also need to be, need to be, need to be blessed. Now, there is a chapter that I discovered. And, you know, I don't know whether there are other chapters. That is a chapter on ministry. And, um, but we really have not seen it as such. And uh, that chapter, if I mention it, some of us might say, wow, welcome. Uh, it's Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is popular because you remember that Jesus quoted it. Jesus quoted it when he was about to start his ministry. And he said, today is this scripture fulfilled before your very eyes. But let us just look at Isaiah 61. And the proof of why that scripture is a scripture about ministry. Now, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That is how this chapter starts. And it says, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn. Now, if you look at this verse, if you look at this scripture, the reality is that it started with the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So if the spirit of the Lord God is upon us, it means that everything, because you see, every other thing that you see in this scripture is actually prefixed by the spirit of the Lord God. So if the spirit of the Lord is upon us, these are the things that, you know, we have the mandate by the spirit of God to fulfill. And so it just expands the mandate and the scope of operation of the spirit of God as it rests upon us. And um, so you then see, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beautiful ashes, all of joy for mourning, garment of praise for spirit of heaviness. So we don't understand sometimes that when somebody is bereaved and we go to meet the person, stay with the person for one week and all that, all of these things come by the spirit. And what happens? We give unto them that mourn. We give them beauty for ashes. We encourage them. We do all of these things, but Jesus, read the portion of the areas where he was going to minister under the spirit of God. But every other thing that we find, he says, you are going to build the old waste places. Now you are going to see when God begins to do this new Nigeria and the new gospel of the kingdom comes, a group of people will have the mandate of rebuilding the old waste places, all of the scriptures, all of the gospel that was corrupted there must be a group of people who will come to now say this is the right way and they will show us from the scriptures and then you know so many other things you know loving you know they you shall be named the priests of the lord he shall call you the ministers of god you shall eat the riches of the gentiles and in their glory you will boast yourself and all that and all that and all that now we can read it in our spare time but you see i just said that to say that there is an expanded outlook of ministry that even the scriptures furnish us with, uh, rather than the limited definition wherein we have looked at ministry as the firefold offices alone. So brethren, I think going forward, uh, the spirit of the Lord 
anoints us to do so many, many other things, to encourage other people, to take them, to take their hand and to lead them and all that. So, now, but what about ministry to the body? What about ministry? Now, the idea of ministry to the body, Paul demystified, you know, when he spoke about how the body is constituted. Ephesians, that same Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, he began to talk about how, uh, let me quickly get it and uh, so I can do this. Because once we just, once we do this, we can move on to just yet another Ephesians chapter four. Now he says, verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, verse 11, uh, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. So this is, these are the things the Lord wants done. So number one, these fivefold ministry offices, they have a joint responsibility. And so the practice whereby somebody says, I'm a pastor, and you are the only person occupying ministry and all of that, and there is no apostle or, or teacher with you and all of that, it is not right. Because when they mentioned apostles, prophet, teachers, and all of those things, the joint responsibility that they have, worshiping in the same place and manifesting their gifts in the same place is supposed to achieve all of these things. Now, verse 13 says, for the edif uh, 12, edifying the body of Christ, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So these are the things that God wants to achieve. The unity of the faith, knowledge of the son of God, and get into a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby the lying wait to deceive. Let me stop there and quickly establish what I was about to say. Now, the intention of God is that we all come, we all come to the unity of the faith. And we can never come to the unity of the faith if our attitude, when we look at other people to whom we minister, are just the flock, you know, they're just body to us. We are the ministers, they're the people who are supposed to hear. No, you know, there is ministry that they need to also offer, particularly when we come together. And so this is why when ministry comes, there must be people who ask questions. There must be people who want clarification. The essence is that if I have some body of knowledge, I dispense that body of knowledge onto the body. And then everybody receives that body of knowledge so that they know what I know. The essence must be for people to know what I know. I don't intend to hide it. And I don't want to be one superstar among everybody. Who knows? And everybody, you know, they just listen. And, no, that would be a wrong spirit. But to see brother Chris will dispense you know brother Joe will dispense and I also get the benefit of what they know so that we all come to a knowledge of the same things and then the entire body grows that is what Paul was describing that ministry is supposed to be like so brethren going forward this is what so he then says in verse 15 speaking the truth in love, hmm, that we all may grow up into him in all things, unto Christ, who is the head, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies is nourished by the edifying of itself. And it makes increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. So now we could go into the operational heart of ministry, but that is not, you know, we would, we would maybe some other day we'll just take that as a topic. So brethren, I think um, we can move on very quickly and I think I can manage just one more and um, before we close and hopefully we'll just finish the entire thing next week and then we can get into discussion. Now, stage four, like I said, is understanding ministry and unity of the spirit. And that goes from understanding the body of Christ and how we are structured as the body. Now, stage five now talks about understanding the Great Commission. Now, we're looking at all of the things. Now, many times, you know, when we come to Christ, we all we're doing is that we are 
you know, because some people manifest certain graces, we say we are looking for power as well. Brethren, why are we looking for power? You know, at any point in time, when we look for power, then we're, you know, it's actually our, our flesh that is crying out. You know, we must always seek Jesus at all times. And when you seek Jesus, when Jesus comes unto you, he comes with his power. And we are never derailed. So this is the right way to seek power. You seek God's peace, comes into your life, and then you are able to manifest him. But as we speak about understanding the Great Commission, then the passage that I find very interesting that I think I can just quickly take. Acts chapter, Acts chapter nine, and um, I don't know what, whether I don't, just because of time, let me, let me take it from, um, because we know how he encountered the Lord and then, um, and God sent Ananias to him. So let me take it from um, verse 17, because we know the story. Ananias went his way and entered into the house. God had told him to go and lay his hands on Paul and uh, to receive his sight. And putting his hand on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forth me, and arose and was baptized. 19. And when he had received meat, meaning that he had been fasting since the time that he came into the house. Then he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Now, this is Paul just being with the disciples a certain number of days. We are not told weak. We're just told a certain number of days, a months. But you know, just being with the disciples for just a few days, Paul was able to get up. And the Bible says straight away, he began to preach Christ in the synagogues that this Jesus is the Son of God. Wonderful. And so, what then? Why is this passage important? First of all, the ministry of Jesus Christ was ministry that was not lived within the house. I think we need to just look at that. You know, it was ministry wherein it was going from town to town, from village to village, and, you know, where he encountered, you know, Jairus' daughter, it was outside, they didn't come to meet him at home, where he encountered, you know, blind Bartimaeus, it was outside, where he encountered, um, you know, what's this short man, um, what's his name now? Um, who was shot and Zacchaeus. had to climb the Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus. it was outside. You know, where he encountered several people. It was outside. So it was a ministry that was outside. And brethren, we are called to be like Jesus. And so in our professional life, we often think that the people who teach and preach are the people alone who are called to just share the gospel and actually fulfill the Great Commission. It is a great error. Our place, our office, our calling, our profession, they are actually ministry fields. They are fields for ministry, and we must understand it as such. So let me just uh, quickly paraphrase this. The Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus Christ said, when the Holy Spirit is come, he says he will lead us, John 14, uh, John 16, I think 13 to 14, he says he's going to lead us into all truth. He's going to guide us. He's going to be with us. He's going to show us the things to come. And he will glorify Jesus. And he will receive the things that pertain unto Jesus and show them unto us. Now, but you see, so all of this is good. Through this, we get to know the scriptures. And then we can share it. We can do all of the things that we do. But you see, we forget that the same Holy Spirit, Jesus said, in Acts chapter 1, 8. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Not in your houses, my brothers. Not in our houses. Not in my own house. But you will be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Brethren, I have shared here before how Jesus said we are the light of the world. And so it's not just talking about your neighborhood. Jesus meant every word that he said. Now, it's somebody like Mother Teresa, I don't know. She's probably not even born again. She was just a Catholic who had just the heart to just gather orphans and poor children and all that and take care of them. Look at the impact that she made all over the world. She wasn't going and walking all over the world. She just did what she did in India. And that model, that model, you know, reverberated around the world that, you know, even when she died in India, she was given a state burial. So there is a dimension of the work of the Holy Spirit that there is a dimension wherein within our homes, as we fellowship with him, we are translated from glory unto higher glory. And then we become more and more in the image and likeness of God. But there is a dimension to us wherein we also have to minister to people who are outside. And for people who are outside, we have to actively seek them. Sometimes you hear somebody is sick. You want to go and pray for them. You hear that somebody is bereaved. You want to go there and comfort the person. You know, this is a ministry that is outside. And then in your office, there are people who don't know the Lord. During the break time, you can ask them whether, you know, have you, you know, you don't know this Jesus. Do you, can we take 10 minutes every day of this break time? And I just open, you know, one passage to you and all that. And you could have a time where you have about two or three people in your office. That's a ministry field. You cannot tell the person who will be born again. You may be there because when this person receives the gospel, the way is going to go, you know, it may be that he is going to blossom even over and beyond whatever it is that you could have done. But your joy will be that God enabled you to be able to bring such a person to the knowledge of Christ. So now, but understanding the Great Commission, let, is, let me try and bring it together and I will close. Why the Great Commission is a part of the life of every Christian. Now, because you agree with me, when the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, teach us to pray, Jesus then and taught them, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be that. Jesus taught them to pray and prayer. Why do we feel we need to pray the Lord's prayer? It was a commandment of how to pray. It was uh, a, a, a distillation of how to pray that Jesus gave unto his disciples. And so we see ourselves as the modern day disciples and we believe we can also pray the prayer that Jesus said that the disciples should pray. But in the same breath was the way he said, and Jesus came and spoke to his disciples, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All power in heaven and on earth have been given to me. You know, in my name, go out into the world. I spoke to his disciples. Go out into the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of every nation baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you always, commanding them to, um, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded them. And I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. So let us tie everything together. Now, when, when, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, we were separated from God. And Jesus came and he mended, repaired the wall of separation. What happened? By the time Jesus came, the whole world was in darkness. And God still wanting to redeem and reclaim the world that he created, began to look at, okay, how am I going to do it? These people already have free will. And so I cannot legislate and say that everybody, you just have to be born again. It will negate free will. And so God instituted that by the instrumentality of preaching, the people who will hear him and be converted and come into his kingdom where they will do things according to his will, you know, that will be the mechanism by which they will come in. Now, 
But what was it that Jesus did? Jesus told them to pray that the kingdom of God will come. And by the time that Jesus taught them, he now gave them the Holy Spirit and said, this kingdom I said, and you have been praying about should come. You now become the ministry agent, you know, for the people who will come into this kingdom. So, that, so you see it now, Lord Jesus Christ, thy will be done on earth, um, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth. We are sent forth. Either you are a professional or you are whatever, in whatever area. Do you know that you can be a professional and your Saturday and Sunday, you are using it to just minister to other people? So you see that we are professionals is not an excuse. You know, in our homes, around our neighborhoods, we must be able to find people who are not saved that we are ministering to and we're reaching out to. You know, um, I'm not doing all I'm supposed to be doing. That is a confession. But I'm just saying that, you know, this is the way we ought to go. But in our around our home, we've set up something that we do every month. We just call people around, Christians and non-Christians. Let's just see, you know, let's just talk about God. Let's talk about the gospel. It's not a denominational thing. And we invite people. So I'm saying that, you see, there must be something that we're endeavoring to do. You know, even if we're not doing that, you know, we can just go from, you know, you are in a box in a in, in a number of flats. Why don't you just say one weekend, let's go to one person and just speak to the person, speak to one family and all that. So and you can just start fellowship within your group of compa compounds and neighborhoods. So this is the way that everything connects to one another. And you know, the intention of God is that we now spread out. And as we preach the gospel, signs and wonders following. If it pleases God, men will be converted to the level wherein, you know, the prophecy in Habakkuk chapter two can be fulfilled and the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that's Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14, I believe. So brethren, I think it's a good place to just, um, uh, to just, um, uh, to just put a stop today and we discuss the next two stages next week by the grace of God. So I, I think uh, brother Joe, I can stop here. If there are going to be comments or if they're going to be anyhow as the spirit directs you to just lead us. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Um, well, we are just uh, <laughs> well, I just tell you this platform. I'm happy to be able to be to continue. It's a very, it's a very sensitive uh, discussion, but uh, it's very good that we should know what do you mean of the nature of faith, what do you mean of being your spirits, and to expand for that. I, I love that word, so, you know, so that we are not we are not toes, we are not toes to and fro as children. So no, you have win this one yet, you win this one there. No, this platform should make us have basic understanding. So just get ready your questions, just get ready our comments so that we can be a robust moment, more people will be in the platform. Uh, I think uh, maybe network has been a problem. For me, here has been a battle on, out on, I've received call from Helene, and look could not join because, say, I meet a lot on, I think it's on, but the network, oh, wow. not anyone who, so it will throw me off. I have to, I have to now go and get a, a, a one day data for my MTN, you know. Then, uh, uh, so it's been on and off and off and off. So, brother, I just thank God. I think I will uh, will uh, close the meeting. And then next Wednesday. Even you, your voice is coming and going. I hope uh, I will clear throughout. Right. Uh -huh. So then uh, by. Uh, then we'll be able to uh, make any contribution or ask questions, but just get all your questions. Don't be over time people said, but I don't want you to, I don't mean I wouldn't want any argument or post to be on the platform. Let's get everything uh, discussed, then uh, we can come over the platform. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Like, even to make up what you are saying, it's difficult. Hallelujah. Oh, it's difficult. So, I would just say that Baron to me will continue uh, next when he's through with the subject. Then uh, whatever comment or questions we have, we we'll come. The yes. subject is very key, very important, very oh, okay. important for brethren to know what is the what we mean by unity of faith, unity of faith, and all that. So we can have better understanding. We cannot toss to and fro. As that is very very to get at the Bible, the Bible study. So let's uh, close the meeting. I wish you will uh, just uh, please. Uh, Close say the closing prayer for us, and uh, in our next meeting, Baruti will continue. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 We bless your holy name, Lord. We give you praise, O God, for your mercy upon us, for your favor upon us as your church, O God, giving us privilege, O God, to come to you at a season, in a period as this, that famine is all over the system, that famine of the world, is all over the of the land. Father, thank you, Lord. Father Jesus Christ, give us this day our daily bread. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this bread. There are people that have desire and long to see a time and a day as this, but it couldn't come to them. But Father, thank you. It could, thank you, Lord, that you made it available for us. You made it a, this bread of life. Ethiopian and I say, how can I understand if no one? Thank you for those ministries. You have made available both to teach, both to direct, and to instruct. Father, thank you. Lord, one of the things that the apostles, the at church, the early church were doing meeting. Breaking of bread, sharing of the word, and prayer. And these are one of the things that made them manifest the life of Christ, that they were called Christians. Father, thank you, Lord, for this grace upon us. Thank you for the vessel you have used. Thank you for the anointing of God. Thank you for all of us who have gathered under the coverage of this ministry, that we may receive your word through this vessel. Father, may your name be highly exalted. In the mighty name of Jesus, our God, Amen. we call upon your name tonight. He said, if you love me, keep my commandment. Lord, you, this word are not coming to us for hid knowledge. It's not coming to us for teaching material. It's coming to us for life application. Lord, we receive grace. Give us grace to apply them. Give us grace to walk in the light of this world. Give us grace to be doers of this world. In the name of the Lord Jesus. You say, happy are you when you know them and do that. That will be doers of God. That will not just be ordinary errors, but will be doers to God in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, the word will not be as the seed that fall by the wayside. Lord, let it be the seed that fall on the good fertile land that bear fruit, fifties and sixties and hundreds of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know there are things choking the world upon us. The care of this life, the suffering things of the world. Lord, we 
we take charge over our soul. We rise above them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this war shall not be choked by the thorns of life. That this war shall not be taken away by the birds of the air. Even that the fowls of religion and political system of the world will not take it away from us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let it bring salvation. Let it bring healing. Let it bring restoration, Lord. Let it bring perfection, O oh God, into his image and his likeness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we continue with you, let your spirit, O oh God, where our brothers stop, let the Holy Ghost continue to minister to your people. Throughout the night and within the week, O oh God, that by the ocean of the spirit, that there will be expansion, O oh God. That in our next meeting, O oh God, that the light of this world will be more clearer, both in the understanding and in the knowledge of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we bless you. We say, we extend the blessing of the meeting, O oh God, to all the brethren that couldn't make it. We extend the grace of this meeting tonight to all the brethren that could do make it, either by one reason or the other. May them receive the grace. May them receive the oil of gladness of God that have come through this meeting of God in their various homes and destinations of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bless your servant who have used of God. Lord, may he be blessed. Let him be blessed of God. Let everything about him be blessed, O oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, that the channels of your revelation, O oh God, be open unto him, O oh Lord. That they that call it unto you, O oh God, be made available unto him, O oh God. That more grace, O oh God, upon this ministry. That more grace upon this anointing, O oh God, to the glory of your name, O oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. As we go to sleep, we pray for peace of the mind and the heart of God. We pray for the sweet sleep of God, that your Holy Spirit, our comfort, our leader, will lead us in the path of righteousness for the sake of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, because you know you have us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless.